Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce James Wells. So I, I don't want to do a long introduction, but he's uh, from the University of Michigan where he's a professor. He spent time elsewhere, including uh, several years at CERN. He's a theoretical physicist uh, with a great interest in, in big picture origins questions for how to make sense of particle physics. And today he's chosen a particular topic within that area, which is, you know, why, why are we made of matter and not antimatter? So take it away, James. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Douglas, and uh, appreciate the invitation to uh, talk with you today. I sure wish I could have come uh, uh, last year, and uh, it's unfortunate that was canceled because of community transmission of this uh, virus, and I hope one day in the not-too-distant future to be able to come and, and uh, see you there in person. Uh, so, yes, I would like to talk about... Uh, the issue of uh, how matter won out over antimatter in the universe and um, and seeking clues for for why that might have happened uh the, what's in the diagram there is uh up, is a proton up uh, down down quarks that make up the proton and uh, uh uh, sorry, that's the neutron. Uh, up and two down quarks uh, make up the neutron. We'll talk about neutrons oscillating to anti-neutrons. We'll also talk about uh, protons uh, decaying and how that is uh, uh, could be possible clues for matter winning out over antimatter. Okay, so um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, the key topics I wish to discuss are uh, four categories principles and particles, uh, physical realities, rules, and its obeying particles. Uh, that will really be the core. Uh, what are the rules of nature that are sacrosanct? Uh, and then we go to soft principles, uh, realities, accidental symmetries, and how some of the rules that we sometimes impose are soft rules that could easily be violated. And, and it's those soft rules that uh, violation that might lead to a matter over antimatter in the universe. And then the matter versus antimatter mystery, the mystery of why there's more particles rather than their antiparticles circulating around in the universe. Uh, that mystery is, uh, requires explanation, uh, we think, and uh, I will talk about that briefly. And then uh, some discussion about hard experiments, testing soft principles. So uh, neutron oscillation experiments are difficult experiments, and, um, and there will be a future neutron oscillation experiments. And I wish to uh, give you, at sort of the undergraduate level, what neutron, anti-neutron oscillation physics is. And we'll do an estimate that uh, uh, any uh, undergraduate uh, advanced undergraduate taking quantum mechanics will immediately recognize. Okay, so the, the principles, uh, the laws of physics respect Lorentz invariance and local gauge symmetries. So Lorentz invariance, meaning that uh, laws of physics need to be symmetric under rotations and boosts. And the gauge uh, symmetries are the electromagnetic gauge symmetry, uh, electromagnetic gauge invariance, in other words, electric charge conservation, the strong force gauge invariance, color neutral bound states uh, is part of what comes out of that after chiral symmetry breaking. So this is a strong interaction. There's an invariance of that in nature. And the weak force gauge invariance, so isospin conservation, which happens to be spontaneously broken in the ground state and gives mass to the, the vector boson carriers, W and Z bosons, and also the fermion masses and Higgs boson. So this is an, an analog to superconductivity that in the Meissner effect of the spontaneous breaking of the symmetry gives rise to a massive photon in a superconductor and the weak force being spontaneously broken gives rise to massive force carriers as well. But that doesn't change the fact that the underlying respected symmetry of the theory is the, the weak interactions the strong force, the electromagnetic inter interactions, which is part of electroweak uh, gauge symmetries. So 
Now, what does this mean in practice? Uh, what this means is that the constituents of nature must have very well-defined properties with respect to these symmetries. It cannot be ambiguous. They must transform as representations of the symmetries to use group theory language. And uh, let's go to the next slide, which is uh, the standard model. These are all the uh, putative elementary particles in nature. Uh, on one slide here is uh, up quark and down quark. These, these two quarks make up the protons and neutrons as constituent quarks of the protons and neutrons. The charm quark is just simply a copy of the up quark, except for it's heavier. And the top quark is simply a copy of the up quark, except for it's heavier than both the up, up quark and charm quark. Likewise, the strange quark is just a copy of the down quark, but heavier. And the bottom quark is a copy of the down quark, but heavier. So these are first, second, and third generation quarks. And then these are the leptons, up uh, electron, muon, tau. So the muon is just exactly the same as the electron, except for heavier. And the tau is exactly the same as the electron, except for heavier. And they're corresponding neutrinos. And these are the force carriers, the Z and W boson, photon, and gluons. And the Higgs boson is what gives mass to, uh, to everything that has mass in the theory. So this is a one picture slide of, uh, of the standard model. What, this, uh, what I have on the right hand side of this picture is what their precise transformation properties are under the symmetries that we believe in, so to speak. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, we will not call into question uh, the symmetries of the Lorentz symmetry, the, the electromagnetic strong and weak, for, weak symmetries. So the, uh, uh, as you know, each fermion has a left and right-handed component, and in the standard model, they can transform differently. Uh, so a left-handed electron, it has a well-defined uh, transformation properties under the Lorentz group. It transforms under the spin one-half representation, and it has two components under the Lorentz group, a minus one-half projection and a plus one-half projection. The electric force, it's got very well-defined properties under that, unambiguous, it's charge minus one. Under the strong force, it is a singlet, it has no charge under the strong force. And under the weak force, it's a two-dimensional uh, doublet. It's actually very similar to the Lorentz uh, uh, symmetry. It's an SU2 uh, type of symmetry. This is an internal, uh, this is a, a space-time symmetry, Lorentz, and this is an internal symmetry of isospin with electron and a neutrino. So very well-defined properties under these symmetries. The, uh, the Z boson has very well-defined properties under the Lorentz group, it's spin one. Under electric uh, electromagnetism, it's charge zero. Under the strong force, it's a singlet. Under the weak force, it's part of a three-dimensional adjoint representation of SU2, to, to use that language. And, and we can go further. Let me just state one more. Uh, the right-handed top quark, it's a spin one-half object under the Lorentz group. It's a charge plus two-thirds under uh, the electric strong force. It's a three-dimensional representation. There's a red, green, and blue uh, uh, right-handed top quarks, the three colors uh, that the top quark kind of, uh, And when you do an SU3 strong interaction transformation, it just mixes up these components of the, of the top quark. And under the weak force, it's singlet. It has no charge under the weak force, the right-handed top quark. So all of these objects have very well-defined symmetry properties and transformation properties under the symmetries that we believe are true and sacrosanct in, uh, in nature. And now, so that's the first element. When you have a symmetry that you believe in, the first element is to identify objects uh, transformation properties under them, your fundamental objects that have transformations under them. And the second thing you need to do is understand what are the allowed interactions that are consistent with these symmetries. So the allowed interactions are 
piecing them together, these three, there's a Z boson, electron, and a positron. You can also make a photon interacting with an electron and positron. And at, these interactions have to be invariant under in, transformations of the Lorentz group. It has to be invariant under transformations of electromagnetic uh, uh, gauge transformations. It has to be invariant under strong and under weak transformation. So all those transformations, they need to be invariant under them. And this is allowed. This is also allowed. Gluon going to quark, anti-quark. Photon going to anti-quark, anti-quark. Z naught. There's a four-point interaction of W bosons. And there's a Z boson interaction with W plus and W minus. And there's many, many, many more interactions. I've just listing four of them. Uh, but there's, there's a many infinite number of interactions that are not allowed. So what is not possible is a Z boson goes to a top quark and a photon. That would break electromagnetic invariance, it would break weak invariance and strong invariance and Lorentz invariance. If I put a Z boson, top quark, and a photon there, total disaster, uh, no, this interaction is just simply not allowed, even though the states that I use to make up that false interaction are allowed. So with symmetries, you know what the, uh, you have uh, well-defined transformation properties and you have the allowed interactions of those objects. And that's gonna be very, very important to us to uh, note that. Now, there is a theorem. It's the baryon and lepton number theorem, I might call it. And when you hear the word baryon number, just think of matter. And anti-baryon is antimatter. And what we've done so far is that we've agreed that all the sacrosanct symmetries are respected. Lorentz symmetry, electromagnetic, weak force, strong force symmetries are all respected. We've agreed on that so far. Uh, but now what if we add one more principle? to these. It's distinct from these principles. There's another principle that we're going to add. And the other principle is the so-called renormalizability principle. And that means that the dimensionality of, the, of any operator that you're allowed to talk about in particle physics has to be equal to four or less. This four comes from three plus one dimensions of space. So that's a magical number for, for this principle. So you need to be at, at four dimensions or less. And uh, for example, here's an operator, a W quark, a W boson with a quark and an anti-quark. The W boson has dimension one, a quark has dimension three halves, and an anti-quark has dimension three halves. You add up those dimensions and you get dimension four operator. This is allowed. If I were to string along a few more fields at the end of this operator, for example, a Higgs boson, dagger Higgs boson, that would take it up to six dimensions and it's not allowed by the renormalizability principle. And technically speaking, renormalizable theories means that the number of parameters you have in your theory is enough to renormalize to get uh, uh, any prediction uh, you wish. If you go beyond this, if you allow operators beyond four dimensions, then you have an ever increasing cascade of operators that you need to consider for predictions at higher and higher uh, uh, accuracy. So, so this was, uh, and I will state in a few minutes uh, why the renormalizability principle was, was grabbed the hold of so strongly for, for many years. But if we apply that principle, then we get a new, a, a new symmetries out of our theory that go beyond these sacrosanct symmetries. And one of the new symmetries you get out is baryon number conservation, meaning the, uh, a particular quantum number that I can assign to strongly interacting quarks stays the same for every single process. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. This is a so-called accidental symmetry because of this imposition of the renormalizability property. It's accidental. 
if I go to higher and higher dimensional operators, I don't have that symmetry anymore necessarily. So this is an accidental. So the baryon number for protons and neutrons is one, and the baryon number for antiprotons and antineutrons is minus one. So, uh, and each of these quarks have baryon number of a third. So right here in this green box, I have the proton is made up of an up, up, down quark uh, combined together in a composite state. So it's one third plus one third plus one third baryon number. That makes the total baryon number of the proton one third. Same with the proton, one third, one third, one third. The total baryon number is one. And if I have antiparticles, it changes the baryon number from, uh, from one third to minus one third for antiquarks. So if you start from nothing, if you start from zero baryon number, you must produce baryons and antibaryons in equal measure, in equal numbers, to preserve this symmetry, this conservation law. So if the early universe starts out with no baryon number at all, uh, so in other words, no preference for matter over antimatter in the early universe, then it, that, that lack of preference stays forever. You cannot violate it. And, and we should have baryon number of zero in the universe today. Uh, be, uh, and that is, a, that is a requirement if we were to impose this renormalizability principle. Now here's an example of a uh, object with baryon number that decays and baryon number is preserved. So this is a neutron decay. It decays in 800 and something seconds. And a neutron is made of an up, down, down. And then it decays into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. And this is, uh, uh, here's the way, one way we could write it down here on the right. Neutron goes to proton, electron, neutrino. The initial state is the neutron. And it has baryon number of one because the neutron has three quarks and each quark is baryon number one third, so it has baryon number one. The final state also has baryon number one because the proton has baryon one, the electron has baryon number zero, and the neutrino has baryon number zero. So the rules of baryon number is that elect leptons like electrons and muons and neutrinos and so forth have no baryon number. So this process preserves baryon number and it goes the initial state is one and the final state is one so it is allowed to happen it doesn't violate anything so neutron decays into proton and and we see it so it's not a surprise that experiments saw that now proton decay so that's a different story because the proton is is uh is heavier uh, lighter, it's not going to decay into a neutron. There's not, there's no, you, you, can't, you can't run this tape backwards because there's not enough energy in the, uh, of, of the rest mass of the proton to decay into a neutron, electron, and a neutrino. So you can't, you can't make it go backwards because of the mass ordering of these states. So you have to ask, well, what can the proton decay into? And if you were just thinking about the sacrosanct symmetries, only those, the Lorentz, Lorentz invariance, charge conservation, strong force, weak symmetry, all these are preserved if the proton decays into a pion, which is made of a quark and an antiquark, so it has baryon number zero, uh, a pion and a positron. There is nothing wrong with this decay at all from the point of view of the sacrosanct symmetries. So why have we not seen it? Why did, not, why did it not happen immediately? And one of the proposed answers to that is because it violates the renormalizability principle, one might say. So under renormalizable interactions, there is no prospect of something with baryon number one decaying into final states that have no baryon number. And that is the problem with this particular decay. It really just comes down to this renormalizability principle and not the sacrosanct symmetries. So something I just sort of pulled out of a hat seems to be constraining 
what the proton can do. So I, I, I believe this is a, a rather weak principle. Let me show you diagrammatically uh, what would happen if the proton decays into a pi zero and a positron. So here's a proton, and it's an up, down, up quark all together. And if an up quark and a down quark fuse together into an operator with four fermions coming out of the vertex, and then creates a positron and a U down quark, then you have the proton going to a pion and a positron. But this interaction is a dimension six operator. It's higher than dimension four. It has four fermions, and fermions have dimension of three halves. So four times three halves gives you six. And uh, so that's too high, and it violates the renormalizability principle, and it is not allowed if you stipulate that principle, and that forbids this decay. And the fact that the decay has not been seen uh, yet gives some credence to the prospect that only renormalizable operators are having much of a role in, in, in nature. But there are implications of abandoning renormalizability as a necessary principle. So on this slide, I want to be just a little bit philosophical and historical, and, and even at a slightly technical, perhaps, on a field theory. The other slides, uh, I think, are, are all undergraduate um, accessible, but this one uh, might not be. Uh, so let me make a claim and then, and then give a little bit of commentary about it. So the claim is that a proton can decay and neutrons can oscillate to anti-neutrons, even if we keep all our sacrosanct symmetries as long as we allow for non-renormalizable interactions. So the commentary on that is a few points I'd like to make. One is uh, recall that requiring renormalizable interactions was the premise to the theorem that gave us baryon number conservation as an accidental symmetry. Okay, so that, that you know we talked about. And the next point in red here is that there is nothing special about renormalizable interactions. This is a philosophical point. Only historical reverence uh, uh, from QED's meteoric rise has, uh, was in the way of us thinking of non-renormalizable theories as being just as good as renormalizable theories. So when QED came about in the 1940s, it was this beautiful renormalizable, renormalizable theories that explain everything in photon electron interactions. And, um, and, and it did not need any additional couplings. The couplings were finite and stayed finite. And you could renormalize the theory and absorb infinities in, uh, and corrections into the same parameters, just updating the parameters order by order and perturbation theory, but there was no new parameters that were generated by the process. So that looked to be, it was, it, it was so successful and so beautiful and so on that uh, there was a big push to consider that every theory uh, that was a true uh, honest to goodness theory of nature needed to be renormalizable. Now, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the next red point down here and say, well, that really created a problem for relativity, general relativity, because that is uh, clearly a non-renormalizable theory. Uh, there's no infrared flows to a renormalizable interaction. Nevertheless, in the low energy limit, general relativity is a perfectly healthy, happy, low energy quantum theory. It's, it's completely consistent with quantum mechanics and healthy and fine in the low energy and low energy limit. Not until you get up to in Planck does general relativity have some issues you have to deal with in making quantum mechanics and general relativity uh, coexist. So the, the low energy effective theories uh, uh, to renormalizable terms, uh, uh, they, they, uh, the low energy effective theories are sort of a infrared flow of a higher dimensional theory uh, so you flow down into the infrared and only the lowest order interactions are important. 
And so you have this emergent renormalizable theory in the infrared limit. And, and so that is what tricks us into thinking that it might be a principle of renormalizability. But it's just the natural flow into the infrared that the operators that, that stay relevant, and that's even a technical term, the operators that stay relevant in this infrared flow are the ones with dimension four. And finally, um, non-renormalizable terms uh, allow new kinds of interactions that renormalizable theories say are forbidden. And that is, uh, the, the baryon number is the prime example of that, in my opinion, uh, is the renormalizable term, non-renormalizable terms that you can add higher dimensional operators that, that violate the renormalizability principle, but do not violate anything else, they, uh, of our sacrosanct symmetry, they will then give rise to baryon number non-conservation. And therefore, the potential to create a matter, antimatter asymmetry. So it's really going beyond renormalizability that can give us that potential. So an experimental fact is that the to uh, that we think is uh, true with a lot of effort in, in establishing this is that the universe has more matter than antimatter. It has more baryons than antimatter uh, than than, than antibaryons. So that's an experimental fact that it appears. And if symmetry is strict then uh, if the baryon number uh, symmetry conservation were strict, then the proton and antiprotons would be produced equally in the Big Bang dynamics and in the flow, cosmological uh, history flow after that. However, baryon number violating processes can get more baryons out than antibaryons. And there are several conditions that are required to make that happen, the so-called Sakharov conditions. I'll just mention an uh, 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 important one here is that the X, uh, some uh, X particle might decay into a Y and Z particle. Here, is, here it is diagrammatically, X particle decaying into Y and Z. And, uh, and it can, uh, you can create more baryons by the baryon number of the X particle not being equal to the baryon number of the Y and Z particles combined. So that's a violation, sort of like what proton decay, proton decay would do that. But in addition to that, you also need CP violation where the decay rate going uh, from particles to particles is different than the decay rate going from antiparticles to antiparticles. So CP violation is another Sakharov condition needed and you need to do that in order to make sure that you just everything just doesn't wash out by by uh, particles going to particles, antiparticles going to antiparticles, and washing out the asymmetry. You need some kind of asymmetry in the decay rate there. So, but that is uh, something that can be arranged. Uh, the most important thing is to give up on baryon number being a true symmetry of nature. And since it is just an accidental symmetry of renormalizability, I have no problem at all giving up on that. And by the way, you only need a really tiny asymmetry in the very early universe after the first uh, fraction of a second uh, or so. You just need uh, uh, one part in about 10 to, the, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 difference uh, between matter and antimatter for it to turn into today, uh, this matter-dominated universe that we have. So now, let's talk about how do we seek experimental evidence for this baryon number violation. So this is a proton decay into positron and pion. This is a figure from Hyper-K uh, experiments in, in Japan, uh, who they wish to, uh, to look for proton decay. So regarding proton decay, this uh, is uh, actually expected in many grand unified theories. As I state here, this is an expected 
prospect for uh, for baryon number violation. In fact, you see here in their figure this X boson that is a grand unified theory uh, gauge boson that can in intermediate be an intermediate particle in this decay process for the pro for proton decay. There is no firm prediction on the lifetime from grand unified theories for this kind of uh, uh, process to happen. Predictions go from about 10 to the 32 years to about 10 to the 37 years, typically. And the experiment uh, at present, experiments are saying that it needs to be longer than about 10 to the 35 years. So we have a couple of orders of magnitude to probe to see where the sweet spot of proton decay is uh, as induced by grand unified theories that give this higher dimensional operator. The connections of proton decay to baryogenesis would be remote in a sense because it's at a very, very high scale where these operators get generated. And, um, and there might be uh, a bunch of baryogenesis dynamics that are happening associated with it. But then you have to worry about inflation, uh, uh, getting rid of the asymmetry. Inflation might happen at a scale below uh, grand unified theory, and, and there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, even if you were to see proton decay, there's a lot of unknowns about how that would connect to the matter-antimatter asymmetry that we, that we see today. It would certainly tell you the baryon number is not conserved, so that would be great, but it wouldn't tell you so much about um, uh, the matter-antimatter asymmetry. Uh, potentially. However, neutron antineutron oscillations is a little bit different story and that could be much more direct and we might have direct access or nearly direct access to both the dynamics, the particles and states that could create and the operators that can create neutron antineutron oscillation uh, and see those at a uh, collider even uh, potentially. So it's not as motivated from the grand unified theory point of view, but it has more, as I mentioned, more direct application to matter antimatter asymmetry problem. The limits on this operator here are not that strong. So this is a neutron with down quark, up, down, and then it fuses into six quarks uh, interaction. So that's a dimension nine operator. So it's really, uh, high dimensional operator, fuses into six quarks and makes uh, interaction. On the right-hand side, out, out comes three antiquarks, and you make an antineutron out of it. So seeing neutron antineutron oscill oscillation, but not proton decay, uh, is an expectation in some theories. And I'm going to mostly emphasize the neutron antineutron oscillation uh, side of this story because one of the simplest theories that you could possibly write down for the matter-antimatter asymmetry gives rise to neutron-antineutron oscillations that could be found in the next few years. So here's, here's the operator again, neutron going to antineutron, and it's from three quarks coming in and three antiquarks coming out. And what I will talk about, uh, I will talk about uh, an experiment that looked for this, for free neutrons traveling along and then going to anti-neutrons. But there are other probes to this, so-called dinucleon decays. If you get a huge uh, a tank of water, the oxygen molecules can have uh, neutrons inside the nuclei that fuse together and and make pions, for example, or the protons fuse together and make pions. This also, uh, it's mediated by this kind of interaction. And so what happens is a uh, uh, molecules just sort of disintegrates uh, uh, partially inside your huge tank uh, of water and it creates pions and the pions might, uh, then, then uh, the charged pions would, uh, the neutral pions will go to photons and you might see a flash from this, or you might see a Cherenkov flash or something from, uh, from, from charged pions. 
Uh, so I'm not going to talk about dinucleon decays, but the limits from dinucleon decays are similar to the limits from free neutron oscillation experiments. They're, uh, they're, they're somewhat close, but I'm going to emphasize just free neutrons traveling along and then transitioning to an anti-neutron. So here, we, here I'm going to spend a, just a couple of slides uh, talking about, uh, at, at sort of an undergraduate level, quantum mechanics of neutron anti neutron oscillation so so i was i was told that this colloquium series is uh, uh is, is for undergraduate uh level it should be and i completely uh agree that that is the right uh approach to do and um and here there's only one thing on this slide that's not quite undergraduate level and i will explain that uh but we know uh, the Schrodinger equation, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We learned that in, in our cribs. And, uh, and this particular operator coefficient can, has dimension one if I uh, renormalize, if I multiply it by the nucleon mass, the neutron mass to the sixth power. And I have this delta. Uh, so that delta has dimension of mass. Uh, now, and has dimension of energy like the Hamiltonian. So it turns out that if I operate, I have two eigenstates, a neutron eigenstate and an anti-neutron. Uh, and these are so-called, uh, let's call them weak eigenstates, for lack of a better word. Then, uh, then we have uh, the effect of Hamiltonian operating on this has an off-diagonal piece. It gives you the rest energy of the nucleon. It gives you some ambient energy, which will turn out to be uh, the neutron magnetic moment inside of a magnetic field will give you some ambient uh, uh, energy uh, to this eigenstate. Uh, and you also have an imaginary part. This is the non-undergraduate part, I suppose. In many undergraduate uh, courses in quantum mechanics, uh, you do not have decays happening. But what happens is if it's a decay, then it shows up in this kind of Schrodinger analysis as an imaginary part times the decay width. This decay width, capital gamma, is just one over the lifetime of the neutron. Uh, and that will play an important role. So that's the imaginary part of this. And this piece, the delta, uh, is the off-diagonal part. So there's an interaction that can take you from neutron to anti-neutron. So, so the matrix, the, the Hamiltonian matrix, will have off-diagonal pieces associated with this prospect of all of the neutron going to an anti-neutron. And the delta is just the, basically the coefficient to the operator in quantum field theory. So this is just that delta. Okay, now uh, we do things, uh, now, now we, just, we just go. Uh, we know what to do in quantum mechanics, we just go. And we say at time equals zero, the state is a pure neutron. And now what is the state as time progresses? So if I put time equals zero, I see that things work out uh, 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 ni nicely as a, uh, as, a, as a neutron. And uh, we compute the probability that phi is measured to be in bar by the standard probability computation in quantum mechanics. So th what that means is I just take the overlap of the anti-neutron with the wave function at time t. And then I ask, what is the probability that if I were to measure the wave function at that time t, uh, would I get an, uh, an anti-neutron? And the probability is, is what's on the right-hand side of this equation. And, and this is very familiar to, to everybody who's taking this quantum mechanics course, is you have the sine squared 2 theta and, uh, and, and this time-dependent argument of the sine function. And then you also have this exponential decay. And the exponential decay uh, has, has to be there, that's from that imaginary part, because the neutron just might poof out of existence completely and it's not gonna measure as a neutron or an anti-neutron. So your neutron probability will also have an e to the minus gamma t in front. So, so this is the standard quantum mechanics. Now if I were to draw a picture of this, uh, so-called photographs of, uh, of a neutron in time. So here's blue, 
I, I create a neutron at time equals zero, and then I propagate, 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 and then at some point it transitions to an anti-neutron. Well, this, this, this picture is not quite right because I'm not good at PowerPoint. Uh, in PowerPoint, I would make this blue dot here have a little bit of red in it, and then a little bit more red here, and then even more red there, and I, and I would look at the probabilities uh, at any given time, the wave function has a little bit of anti-neutron in it and a little bit of neutron in it. And it would oscillate between blue and red as I progress it down this line. But let me just say that once it, got, once it became dominant anti-neutron, then I turn it to red on this plot. That's my algorithm for making that plot if you want to be really precise. So, so it transitions to a predominantly anti-neutron at this point and then propagates on and then sometime later it will be predominantly neutron. All right, so what does this mean experimentally? Well, uh, let's make some approximations in the reactor environment. And I'm not going to go through the calculation because there's not enough time to do it. Uh, but an important thing, the, uh, the, the reactor that I will talk about is the ILL reactor in, uh, in France. And uh, it has, um, the rest energy of the neutron is much, much greater than the, the energy associated with a magnetic field inside the, the, the reactor the, the, and, and, the, and the guideline. And it's much, much greater, and that is in turn much, much greater than the off-diagonal energy associated with the transition from neutron to anti-neutron. Uh, so when you have this ordering here, that I've written in the top left-hand corner. Uh, if you have that ordering, then you get this equation in red on the bottom. And so the equation simplifies a bit, and, uh, and now we're in a position to start plugging in numbers for what the probability is of finding an anti-neutron at, at some time t. So here's the, here's the theorist's uh, vision of the experiment. Uh, it is some um, uh, big neutron guide. So out here, there's a reactor somewhere. And the reactor is a highly enriched uranium reactor with an extremely high flux of neutrons coming out. And in this guide, the number and a guide especially made for, uh, for this experiment, uh, the flux of neutrons uh, was about 10 to 11 neutrons per second, passing some, if I put some, uh, uh, window there. It's passing uh, the plane at uh, 10 to 11 neutrons per second. The average velocity of those neutrons is about 600 meters a second. And the distance from the reactor to the annihilation target is 60 meters. So a good fair distance, 60 meters to go. And, uh, and the ambient magnetic field, which was important for the equation that I wrote down on the previous slide, it is 10 to the minus eight Tesla. So you're making a kajillion neutrons, they're going down this guide, and then maybe one turns into an anti-neutron. Uh, and and uh, now when, so what does it mean to make a measurement? What it means to make a measurement is that there's an annihilation target down here, and the annihilation target uh, requires a sort of probes uh, and asks, are you a neutron or anti-neutron? Because if you're an anti-neutron, I'm going to explode because it's matter against antimatter. And, uh, and then you register the, the signal of a rather cataclysmic event of matter hitting antimatter. If, if it stayed a neutron, then it just goes through and there's no, no big uh, problem that happens. So this is, uh, again, that's a theorist's uh, version of uh, what this annihilation target is doing. So I can, uh, then I can ask, well, if the, I can make an estimate of what the sensitivity is to uh, neutron-anti-neutron -neutron oscillation to, to this parameter delta. And, and, and actually, it's common to quote the limits as one over delta, the oscillation lifetime. So the longer the oscillation lifetime, uh, uh, the, the better sensitivity you have for a smaller and smaller transition probability to an anti 
anti-neutron. So the higher this oscillation lifetime tau is, the better the experiment is doing. So given the length of the, of the guide and given the average velocity of the neutrons, uh, it's about 0.1 second that you probe. So you have to look at this and you have to ask, what is the probability of seeing an anti-neutron at 0.1 second? And then, uh, and then, you have to, then you have this tiny probability and then you have to multiply that tiny prob probability to all the neutrons th that, that came to the target that could have been an anti-neutron. And that number uh, you take over the course of a year. So if you run for a year, you multiply by this flux per second. So it's a really big number. And, uh, and this flux, uh, you normalize it to a flux of 10 to 11. And you find that the current limit is around 10 to the 8 seconds. If you do it all out correctly, it's one, I think it's 0.8 times 10 to the 8 seconds. It's a factor. This really simple back of the envelope uh, computation gave you only a factor of two off, really, uh, uh, when you have exponentials running everywhere. So this is a, this is a good es estimate. And, uh, and, and the lifetime is long. It's a two, 10 to the 8 second lifetime is the current limit. Now, uh, th so that, that's the current. Uh, they did not find uh, ant neutron going to anti-neutron. So let me just state very quickly some theory work that I did with Christophe Grosjean and Vivian Shakya and uh, my stu student, uh, uh, Kevin Zhang, Zheng Kang Zhang. Uh, the theory work is uh, we constructed what we consider to be the simplest of all models for baryogenesis a sort of an effective field theory version of it. We did not uh, say where some of these constituents came from. We did not try to embed it into string theory or a grand unified theory or anything like that. We just said, what is the minimum amount that I need to add to the theory to get both baryogenesis, so, so the ma matter, antimatter asymmetry like you need, and N and bar oscillations. And, uh, and it turns out uh, that the very simplest theory is, is adding two states, x1 and x2. And those two states, if I go to the next slide, I'm not going to go through all these, uh, this Lagrangian in very much detail, but I just inter we just interacted these states, x1 and x2, with standard model quarks. And then we had x1 and x2 interact through a third operator, and then we just calculate it. Uh, and and we, we have coefficients. So there's two states, three coefficients, uh, and, and masses for these particles, and you just compute. And the computation is, uh, is in-depth because you have to do cosmological evolution. You have to solve the Boltzmann equation for these, uh, for these particles in the early universe. And there are decays, uh, and uh, these x1 and x2s will will decays and make a baryon number asymmetry in the early universe. So we had to do that. So this is the baryogenesis computation in uh, uh, in green, and then there's a separate computation with the same degrees of freedom, which is the neutron anti neutron oscillation uh, operator computation. That one was a lot easier. Because all we had to do was integrate out x1 and x2 to make an operator that gave three quarks in, three anti-quarks out. So that this one was a quite an easy computation, really straightforward. This was uh, much more in depth, and so in the paper we have a long appendix about how to do the the cosmology calculations on this. And what you get uh, is you get a plot like this. Uh, this is, uh, so we fixed a few parameters because we can't look at a higher dimensional space uh, just to give a flavor and a feel for, for what's happening. Uh, uh, so a few parameters are fixed and relations are fixed. On the x-axis is the mass of one of these, one of the two exotic new particles. And on the y-axis is an interaction strength of that uh, second exotic particle with standard model states. So this is a mass 
and this is an interaction strength. And those are the two things we need uh, to make a two-dimensional plot. And, and in this uh, plane, we plotted points. We, we scattershotted over all the parameter space of this theory, and we made a scattershot of every point in this plot uh, has good baryogenesis. The baryogenesis that we see in the universe today is the correct baryogenesis. So that is um, in, our, in our plot here. And um, so these are all good points. And uh, some of the points are ruled out by the limits from ILL and super K. Uh, so that is uh, uh, down here. Those are ruled out. And there are some points that we will never access in any time in the near future because there's no experiment that can give us uh, oscillation lifetimes of 10 to the 11 or higher seconds. But there's a region down in here where there's uh, several new experiments uh, that will be coming online in the next uh, decade or so, or maybe less, maybe longer. Uh, so the ESS, the European Spallation Source in Lund, Sweden, is considering building an experiment that can get up to uh, approximately 10 to the 10 seconds. Even at Oak Ridge, uh, they're thinking about an experiment that could get maybe somewhat close to that. And Hyper-K experiment on dinucleon decays will upgrade uh, the, their sensitivity to what Super-K could do to somewhere up in this region as well. So, so there is a prospect. There's, there's a sim the simplest of all theories, I think, to make baryogenesis has neutron-anti-neutron -neutron oscillation as a, an experimental consequence. And there are experiments that will be coming online in the near future that just, if, if we're lucky and nature has chosen one of these points, uh, we will find it. Uh, we will find evidence for it. Uh, so that would be a major clue that we have understood uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry if we see this. So let me conclude by saying that uh, uh, symmetry is identifying, uh, that we've identified in the underlying theory of matter and forces are not all on equal footing. Lorentz invariance is really solid. Uh, electromagnetic invariance, really solid. Strong force, weak force. Bary baryon symmetry is not. Lepton symmetries, these are accidental symmetries, and they are not rigorously held by, uh, it, it, my view is that they are surely or they're not rigorously held by nature. Uh, so let's search for signs of its violation. And even more motivation for that is that baryon number should be and needs to be violated in order to give us baryogenesis. So we can make theories that do, that do just that, and they can be tested experimentally. So yes, through uh, N bar oscillations, we might find uh, this prospect. And new experimental ideas uh, lead to new possibilities for testing how, how we won out over our anti-selves. OK, thanks, uh, thanks very much. I'll end my presentation there. Thanks very much, James.